I was a late addition to the conference uh, speaker list. Apparently it was because Thibaut wanted to hear about the latest and greatest in gravitational self-force. So I'm hoping that he will not be disappointed. <laughs> we'll see by the end. Okay. So the general context is something we've heard a lot about already at the conference, which is just the gravitational two-body problem in the relativistic regime. It's a very complicated problem with a lot of parameters in general. Here is a plot of the binary parameter space, uh, just two of the dimensions in the parameter space, which is the orbital separation, how far apart the two bodies are, and the mass ratio. And in different regions, we use different approximations or different methods. So if the bodies are widely separated, then their mutual gravity is weak, and we can use post-Newtonian theory or post-Minkowskian theory. Um, if the two bodies are very close together and roughly equal sized, then the most accurate method is full numerical relativity solving the fully nonlinear Einstein equations. Now, what I want to focus on is this corner down here, which is gravitational self force, where one of the bodies is much smaller than the other one, and we can use perturbation theory in the limit of the mass of this one being much smaller than this one. And so I think this is very important limit for multiple reasons. So one is that currently most modeling has really focused on the comparable mass regime. So as you imagine a binary in spiraling down over here. We start off in post Newtonian regime, end up in the numerical relativity regime, tie them together with effective one body theory, and you have your current models that are used in LIGO. Um, but as detectors get more precise, and as we see uh, broader frequency bands with detectors, we will see much greater variety of binaries, and in particular we will see higher mass ratios. So we've already seen mass ratios of order 1 to 10, and we'll see more and more, more extreme mass ratios as we go. So it's important to look in this limit to get accurate models in that limit. There's also more fundamental reasons why this limit is very interesting. So as Alessandra told us, um, the limit is partly already built into EOB. So you can kind of think of EOB as mapping this problem onto that problem. So it it's kind of provides a way to tie together this whole, um, this whole binary parameter space. Now, the follow-up talk by Leo Barak will really focus on that idea of how gravitational self-force um, can really inform EOB and other things. I'm going to be talking about another aspect of why this is interesting. So not only can it model binaries with very extreme mass ratios, but typically we find it's actually remarkably accurate even as we move towards the comparable mass ratio regime. Um, it's much more accurate than you might expect. Okay, back up. But the original motivation for looking at this small mass ratio regime really came from a particular kind of astrophysical system called extreme mass ratio in spirals. So this is really taking the limit of small mass ratio where we're imagining a stellar mass object, a neutron star or a black hole of say a few tens of solar masses or smaller orbiting around a massive or supermassive black hole in a galactic core. So here you typically have mass ratios of order 10 to the five, so very extreme. And these are going to be important signals for LISA and other space-based detectors because they emit in the millihertz regime. <laughs> and the small guy does many, many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of orbits very close to the big black hole. And the orbits are typically very complicated. So you get a very precise probe of the regime of strong gravity near the, small, near the large black hole. And so you get a lot of information about fundamental physics, about astrophysics, um, a lot of unique information that's typically much more precise than other, uh, other systems. Okay, but I don't want to focus on Emery's in this talk. I want to emphasize that the self-force theory is not just a way of modeling Emery's. Um, it's a general method of, of tackling the Einstein equations. So we imagine having an exact space-time that consists of a background space-time plus perturbations due to a small body in the space-time. 
So this background can be anything. It doesn't have to be uh, the background of a big black hole, but in a binary, this will be the space-time of the larger body as if that body were isolated, unaffected by the small body. And then you add perturbations due to the small body. So this quantity epsilon is proportional to the mass of the small body. Now this, these perturbations deform the geometry of space-time, and that deformation affects the motion of the small body itself, and it exerts what we call a self-force. So this is the covariant acceleration in the background space-time. Um, if you ignore these perturbations to the geometry, you just have zero on the right-hand side, just a geodesic equation for a test body in the background. Um, but once you add these perturbations, you get an H1 contributing to a first-order self-acceleration or self-force. Uh, H2 then leads to a second order and so forth. So this is a general method, and the first part of this talk is going to be talking about how this method works independent of what you're modeling. It doesn't have to be the two-body problem. Um, then we will get into specifically modeling the two-body problem. So I'll split it into three pieces. First is self-force theory, uh, the local problem, so dealing with the behavior near the small body in a way that's essentially independent of what the external space-time is. Then go to the global problem, which is solving the Einstein equations in the whole space-time, and then it becomes essential what is the external geometry. And in the binary case, the external geometry will be the space-time of the larger black hole. Then I'll present the newest results, which are second order in perturbation theory, and what we call post-adiabatic waveforms. Okay, oops, jumping a few slides here. Okay, so the local problem. So here I'm illustrating a binary, but the point is, the local problem, you zoom in on the region near the smaller body, and it doesn't really matter what's out here, it could be anything. And most uh, kind of foundational self-force derivations are based on this idea of matched asymptotic expansions. This idea goes back many decades in uh, applied mathematics, but in dealing with a two-body problem, it goes back mostly to the 60s and 70s. Um, Thibault actually used this in the, um, the contribution to the 1982 conference proceedings that we've heard about from multiple speakers already at this conference. So it's a, a well-developed method. So the idea is, outside in the external universe, you use a perturbation where, or use a, a perturbation theory, where you're treating the small guy as a perturbation on top of whatever is out here. So that's what I described on the previous slide. Um, but as you get close to the small one, its gravity becomes dominant over the external gravity, and so then you adapt a different approximation, where you're approximating the space-time here as perturbations on top of the space-time of the small guy. And then in this buffer region, in between the two regions, um, you can feed information back and forth. And from my perspective, the interesting thing and the important thing is to feed information from the inner region, the inner expansion, out into the expansion in the outside world, and essentially integrate out this small region. Okay, so the name of the game here is just solving the Einstein equations in that buffer region. And you get quite a bit of information just from, just from the Einstein equations. So first off, you find that the local solution to the Einstein equations in that region splits quite neatly into two pieces. So here's a space-time diagram with, space with time running up and to the right. Here's the small body moving through the space-time. Um, this is represented as if it's a material body, so the curvature is finite. But it could be a black hole. It, it doesn't matter. It can be anything. It could be something even more exotic than a black hole. No matter what it is, you get this nice split into two pieces. You get a self-field, which is directly determined by the object's multipole moments, so a leading order of the mass, subleading order of the spin, sub-subleading quadrupole moment, and so forth. And then you have a remainder that's very slowly varying in the neighborhood of the small body, or on the, the scale of the small body. And this defines an effective metric, which is the external background plus this other field. And this effective metric is a smooth vacuum metric that's determined by global boundary conditions. So 
The self field is determined by the multipole moments locally. Um, the effective metric, the effective external metric, you can only determine it once you know the global boundary conditions and you solve the full problem. Okay, the other thing you get just from the Einstein equations in the buffer region is an equation of motion for the object's effective center of mass. So this has been derived uh, over many years, starting at zeroth order, test body motion, going up to uh, first order and then second order most recently. Um, so here I'm presenting the result that I derived uh, about 10 years ago, which is that at second order, so up to order epsilon cubed terms, what you get is just geodesic motion in this particular effective metric. So this is now the covariant derivative of the effective metric. This is proper time in the effective metric. And again, this is derived directly from the Einstein equations outside of the object. Uh, as we heard from one of the speakers earlier in the conference, um, just the vacuum equations in the vacuum region already tell you the motion of the object um, in the non-vacuum region. Okay, so also this is all done outside the object where everything's perfectly smooth. There's no regularization of infinities. There's no assumptions about HR. Everything um, is just derived from the Einstein equations. Okay, but it's actually convenient to introduce singularities into the system. And that's what I was meaning by saying that we integrate out the local uh, behavior, the local region. So we don't really care much about the fine details of what's going on very, very close. So we just cross that region out. We then take the analytical form of the metric outside of the body and just extend it down to a representative interior curve. The curve actually lives on this space time over here. Um, and then it becomes singular, just like if you extend a Coulomb field from outside of a charge distribution, it will become singular as 1 over r as you approach the center of the charge. Okay, so the reason this is convenient, even though it introduces singularities, is that you don't have to care about the fine details of what's going on in here. You just deal with the multipole moments that defined this field outside. And you can show um, that this is actually equivalent or a way of deriving a point particle representation of the small object. So here we define the stress energy of the object to be just the curvature of the metric. We find what this metric is, we calculate the curvature, and we call that the stress energy. Um, there's quite a bit of mathematical subtlety in properly defining this thing because this is, doesn't have a, a natural definition as a distribution because it's too singular, but you can find what we call a canonical definition um, in this recent paper with one of my students and find the stress energy uh, that we called the Detweiler stress energy because he was the first one to write it down, although he didn't derive it, um, which is the stress energy of a point mass in the effective metric. So we have test body motion in the effective metric through order epsilon squared, and we have an effective stress energy tensor for the what, we're now, what now, we can now consider a particle uh, that is just a point mass in the effective metric. If you add spin to the object, you'll have a spin term. If you add a quadrupole moment, you'll have a quadrupole moment term. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about the local problem near the small body. So now let's switch to the global problem, which is solving the Einstein equations Given that local representation, um, solve the Einstein equations in the space-time of a big black hole. So at zeroth order in the external space-time, you're starting off with just a test mass moving on a geodesic in the Kerr geometry of the big black hole. Um, that geodesic is characterized by three constants of motion, the energy, the azimuthal angular momentum, and what's called the Carter constant, which is related to the orbital inclination. So you have three constants of motion, and you have three associated phases of motion. So you have radial oscillations in and out. You're also circling around azimuthally, and you have polar oscillations up and down. And so you can associate a phase with each of those motions that runs from 0 to 2 pi in each of the, uh, in each of the periods. And 
you can construct these phases so they have constant frequencies. So the rate of change with time is just a constant frequency constructed from these three constants of motion. So that's the geodesic case. Now, once you're taking into account the metric perturbation and um, the local self force, then these constants are no longer constant. They start evolving slowly with time. And we have two distinct time scales in the system. So this is similar to what uh, Bala was talking about either yesterday or the day before, the separation of time scales. We have a radiation reaction time, which is roughly the time over which these constants change. And that's of order one over my small parameter, so it's a long time. And then we have just the orbital periods associated with those frequencies, those slowly evolving frequencies. And what Hinder and Flanagan showed uh, 13 years ago is that on the long time scale, this radiation reaction time, those orbital phases have a very neat form or the neat asymptotic approximation. So you start off with uh, a 1 over epsilon because the phases accumulate roughly linear with time. So after a long time, <coughs> you end up with a lot of accumulated phase. And then you have subleading terms um, that's independent of epsilon plus corrections. Um, but each of these coefficients are functions of a slowly changing time, not t itself, but epsilon times t. Now, if you've correctly calculated this and correctly calculated that, then you have the phase accurate up to a small correction that goes to zero when the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And so that should uh, be precise enough to do very accurate parameter extraction from an observed signal, of course, depending on the mass ratio. Um, but for small enough mass ratio, you're guaranteed to have very small errors here. OK, so what do you need for each of these things? So this first term is called the adiabatic order phasing. And that's determined just by the averaged dissipative piece of the first order self force. So it's basically just the slow dissipative change in the system, a leading order. Then this is called the first post adiabatic order. And you'd have second post adiabatic, third, and so forth. You can keep going up. Uh, the first post adiabatic order is determined by the averaged dissipative piece of the second order force and the rest of the first order force. So stuff that wasn't already included here. So this is why we have to go to second order. And this is why I, I talked about the second order metric early on. Um, all of this has to be done up to second order to correctly get to this post-adiabatic phasing. And if you omit this, you omit something potentially quite large because it's um, independent of the mass ratio. This could be 10 radians. It could be even one radian would be not good enough for us. So it's uh, something we need to include. OK, Okay. so this is a typical calculation at first order, where you think, OK, the self force is having a small effect. So let's approximate the motion as a geodesic in the black hole space time. Um, you can then use either time domain methods or frequency domain methods. And because it's on a geodesic, it's orbiting around the black hole forever, emitting waves forever with basically fixed frequencies. Um, so this approximation breaks down after some time, which is called the dephasing time. Oops, back up. So you can imagine that this is accurate in some band of, of time here, um, but not over the full in spiral. So what do we do instead to get accuracy on a long time scale? We use this multi-scale expansion which builds on uh, work by Hinder and Flanagan for the motion, but now we're dealing with the full Einstein equation, not just the motion. So we have a set of slowly varying parameters, both the parameters of the orbit, but also the parameters of the big black hole. All of these are changing with time. So I'll just call this list uh, curly J here. And the rate of change of time, rate of change of those orbital parameters and system parameters is slow with time. So you have to start off with a first order driving force, a second order driving force. And these, these coefficients are only constructed from these system parameters. Then you have still these phases of motion that are varying on the rapid time scale and the orbital time scale. And you can build this up such that these are still actually exactly the geodesic frequencies as functions of these slowly evolving system parameters. 
Now we adopt this multi-scale expansion for the metric, where we have amplitudes that the only time dependence is in these slowly varying parameters. So we have slowly varying amplitudes, and then rapidly oscillating phase factors that are coming from these orbital phases. So you can substitute this into the Einstein equation, and then solve order by order for this guy here. Then solve these ODEs to evolve through the system. So you can imagine at each point in, in this parameter space, you're solving the Einstein equations to calculate um, these amplitudes and to calculate these driving forces. Then once you've got that, you've got the rate of change of these guys, which then moves you through the parameter space. So all the hard work is setting up the equations in the right way such that you can solve this in advance and then rapidly zoom through the parameter space. And we now know we can do this, we can generate waveforms natively uh, in milliseconds using tools uh, developed by these people in combination with this two time scale expansion. Okay, so results. So far, the only case we've concretely been solving things at second order is quasi-circular orbits um, around a non-spinning Schwarzschild black hole. So here our system parameters are just the orbital frequency itself, the mass of the big black hole, and a small slowly evolving correction to the, uh, the spin of the black hole. So we start off with zero, uh, zero spin correction, but then it fluxes go into the black hole and the spin can evolve. And we have the only phase now is just the azimuthal phase of the orbit. So here we're never neglecting um, dissipation, we're never neglecting the non-zero radial velocity, but the structure of the calculation is still essentially that we have a sequence of circular orbits that we then evolve through. So we solve the Einstein equation for some fixed frequency and then evolve uh, evolve the frequency to get the waveform. So this was supposed to be the simple test case that we started working on um, in 2013 that I've been working on with Niels Warburton and Barry Wardell at uh, UCD in Ireland. But it's taken us eight years <laughs> to work out all the details and develop the analytical and numerical infrastructure to make this work. So here's the first result we got, which is a calculation of the binding energy of the system. So we go to infinity, we measure the bondy mass of the system, we then subtract the rest masses of the two objects. So one is the rest mass of the small guy, the other is something we actually measure from the numerics, which is the, um, the mass of the central black hole, and then the binding energy is this, just the difference. Now I don't want to get into what is being compared against what here, uh, that's a can of worms, all I want to say is we've calculated this thing from the bondy mass at infinity and done some checks on it to make sure it's behaving properly. Okay, so we've got the bondy mass as a function of frequency. Um, the next thing we calculated more recently is the energy flux out to infinity. So this is just the rate of change of the bondy mass with retarded time along the sky plus. So here we're comparing against actually full numerical relativity and post-Newtonian theory. This is for mass ratio uh, 1 to 10. These, this green curve and the green squares is what we call 1 GSF, so just leading order uh, in self force theory. The blue curve here, this wiggly curve, is full numerical relativity. Um, this orange curve is 3.5 post-Newtonian fluxes. And then this red curve that cuts through the numerical relativity curve, that is our calculated fluxes at second order in the mass ratio. So you see we agree pretty remarkably well with fully nonlinear relativity over a big frequency range, even though the mass ratio isn't particularly small here. So this is the flux basically as a function of frequency for the 2-2 mode, but our agreement um, is also good for the other modes. Okay, this is mass ratio one, two equal sized objects. So you would think mass ratio one, our approximation would be 
total garbage. Why would it work at all? We're expanding in powers of the mass ratio. Um, but no, it's good. So it's important to see the scale here. Uh, obviously, we can see a difference between these curves, but our second order self force calculation in red is off from numerical relativity by, I think, less, less than 1% even here at the end where it starts to go bad. The reason we get this turnover and things start really going bad um, is the two time scale expansion itself breaks down at the innermost stable circular orbit. So we haven't yet tackled the problem of extending into the plunge. That's, that's going to be a separate problem uh, that we have started working on, but we don't actually have it working yet. Okay, so we have pretty remarkable accuracy there. Now, in the two time scale expansion that I laid out, uh, we have local expressions for the rate of change of the orbital frequency in terms of the local self force. We still have not successfully calculated the second order local self force, but we are able to generate waveforms at first post adiabatic order just using the Bondi mass loss formula or the balance law at infinity. So we start off with the Bondi mass. It's by definition the binding energy plus the two rest masses. The flux is by definition the time derivative of this. And we have the binding energy as a function of frequency and as a function of the parameters of a big black hole. Now we can invert this to get an evolution equation for the frequency if we approximate the mass of the big black hole and the spin of the big black hole as constant. So that's not actually consistent at the order we're working with, but numerically, these things are so small that they have very, very negligible impact on the gravitational wave. So we actually get good accuracy, as you'll see, even neglecting these things. So then we can just rearrange this equation to get the rate of change of the, the orbital frequency um, from the flux and from the binding energy. And then we expand this out in powers of the mass ratio and get this waveform. So this is again mass ratio 1 to 10. Um, blue, the blue dotted curve is full nonlinear numerical relativity. The orange curve is our waveform generated with a two time scale expansion. And we see, even though we're neglecting these rates of change of the black hole parameters, we have pretty amazing accuracy. So if you look just by eye here, it looks like we have 100% accuracy. Uh, if you zoom in near the end, you do see we're starting to accumulate some dephasing towards the end. Um, this is only four cycles before merger, or actually three cycles before merger. And here we have about 0.1 radian of error. So pretty, pretty amazing accuracy, even though we're very far from the extreme mass ratio regime, this is only one to 10 mass ratio. Okay, I think I'm out of time, so maybe I'll just leave this up. Big message, self force is very accurate, much more accurate than you'd expect. So some uh, questions or comments? Everybody's happy? Yes, please. Uh, sorry, this rate of change of angular uh, velocity, I mean, I thought, I mean, naively, I thought this should be related to the flux of angular momentum, not the flux of energy. Um, Can you also compute the flux of angular momentum? We have not computed flux of angular momentum uh, because of the structure of the two time scale expansion, you should be able to get it from either one for quasi circular orbits. Okay, so I think there are no questions uh, from uh, remote uh, people. So let's, uh, I will speak here again. Thank you. Thank you.